Ever feel like you're just drowning in information, especially, you know, when you're trying to get a handle on something completely new? Maybe it's a really dense textbook for a class or uh, a new field you need to grasp for work. And it just feels like, well, a lot. Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to give you that shortcut to being genuinely well-informed. Today, we're plunging right into the fundamental concepts of statistics. Specifically, we're looking at Chapter 1 of Mario F. Triola's Elementary Statistics, the 14th edition. Our mission, simple. We want to distill the absolute must-know nuggets from this intro material, make those complex ideas clear, relatable, and really give you the tools to critically evaluate all the numbers that shape our world. So whether you're a student just starting out in stats, maybe prepping for a data-heavy meeting, or you're just curious about how numbers get used and sometimes misused, this deep dive is definitely for you. We're going to unpack the core definitions, those crucial distinctions, and some practical applications. It's all about helping you think statistically, kind of like your statistical superpower training, starting right at the beginning. Yeah, and what's really fascinating, I think, is that Triola's first chapter doesn't just throw formulas at you. It actually starts by emphasizing critical thinking. It's about teaching us to, well, question the data we encounter every day. And that's just vital now, isn't it? With so much information out there. Absolutely. And to question things effectively, you need that solid foundation. So let's start with the real building blocks. When we talk about data or statistics, what exactly do those terms mean? Okay, so data fundamentally are just collections of observations. These could be measurements, uh, survey responses, even simple yes or no answers. And a really crucial point, one people often miss, data are plural. So we should say data are, not data is. Oh, that's a good catch. Oh. Probably get that wrong sometimes. A lot of people do. And statistics then is the whole science behind it. It covers everything from planning studies, getting the data, organizing it, summarizing, presenting, analyzing, and finally interpreting that data to actually draw meaningful conclusions. Okay, so it's much more than just plugging numbers into a calculator. It's a whole investigative process. And within that, you constantly hear population and sample. What's the difference there and why does it matter so much? Right. A population is the complete collection of all the data you're interested in studying. So if you're studying, say, human resource professionals, the entire group of them globally, or maybe just in the U.S., that's your population. Now, if you actually manage to collect data from every single member of that population, that's called a census. Think the U.S. census that happens every 10 years. Which, let's be honest, is pretty rare and often impractical for most yeah, research, right? Exactly. It's usually too big, too expensive, too time-consuming, and that's where a sample comes in. A sample is just a sub-collection, like a smaller slice, selected from that larger population. So if you survey, say, 410 HR professionals, those 400 are your sample. The whole point is to use that smaller, manageable sample to make smart judgments about the bigger population. Okay, that makes sense. And understanding that difference is really your first line of defense against misleading headlines. You know, the ones that take a finding from a small sample and make it sound like a universal truth. Yeah, you see those all the time. Survey finds X percent of people believe Y. Exactly. Knowing the population versus sample distinction is step one to thinking critically about those claims. Got it. The book lays out this statistical study process in three main phases. Prepare, analyze, conclude. Let's start with prepare. What's involved there? Preparation is all about setting the stage properly. First, you establish the context. What do these numbers actually represent? What's the specific goal here? Then, really critically, you look at the source of the data. Is it biased? Does the source have an agenda? Mm, good point. And finally, the sampling method. How was this data collected? Was it unbiased, random, or was it maybe self-selected like an online poll? You need to know this upfront. Okay, so context, source, method. That's prepare. Then you move to analyze. Right. Analyze is where you start digging into the numbers. You graph the data, you look for patterns, outliers, weird values, missing information. You calculate key statistics, look at the distribution, then you apply the appropriate statistical methods. And honestly, technology does a lot of the heavy lifting now with calculations. So our focus can be more on, you know, interpreting the results and applying good old common sense. Which leads straight into conclude. And this is where things get really interesting regarding misleading information. Like you said, critical thinking is key. And the book points out how easily graphs can fool us. Yeah, absolutely. It's a classic technique. The book uses this example about a survey on YouTube as a learning tool. 
one graph, figure one, one, starts its vertical axis way up at 52%. And visually, it makes the difference between Gen Z and millennials look huge, like more than double. Wow. But then figure one, two shows the exact same data, but starts the axis at 0% like it normally should. And suddenly, you see, it's only a tiny 4% difference. That's incredible. Just changing the starting point of the axis completely changes the story. It totally warps perception. And that's even before you do any complex statistics. Another huge flaw is just using a bad sampling method. If you don't collect your sample correctly, your conclusions are basically worthless. Right. Garbage in, garbage out, as they say. Precisely. Two really common bad methods are voluntary response samples and convenience samples. Voluntary response is where people choose themselves whether to participate. Think online polls call in radio surveys. Like that Nightline poll example. Exactly. 186,000 people called in. 67% said move the UN. Sounds impressive, right? Yeah, huge number. But then a proper randomly selected survey of just 500 people found only 38% agreed. The voluntary poll was massively biased because people with strong opinions were way more likely to call in. So more responses doesn't mean better data. Not at all. And a convenient sample is just what it sounds like using data that's super easy to get, surveying your friends, people in the cafeteria. It's easy, but almost always biased. The main takeaway here is really important. Sample data must be collected appropriately, usually through random selection. If it's not, the book puts it bluntly. No amount of statistical torturing can salvage them. That's a strong warning. Yeah. Okay, this leads to another really vital distinction. Statistical significance versus practical significance. They sound alike, but they're not the same thing at all. Not at all. And it's a crucial difference for real world interpretation. Statistical significance means a result is very unlikely to have happened just by random chance. The common cutoff is usually 5%. If the chance of seeing that result randomly is 5% or less, we call it statistically significant. So like getting 98 girls in 100 births, highly unlikely by chance, so statistically significant. Getting 52 girls, it could easily happen randomly, so not statistically significant. Okay, so it passes a mathematical threshold. Hmm. But that doesn't mean it actually matters. Exactly. That's where practical significance comes in. Does the result make enough of a real-world difference to be actually useful or important? The Atkins diet trial example in the book is perfect. Subjects lost an average of about 4.6 pounds over a whole year. Statistically, that result was significant. It probably wasn't just chance, right. but practically. For someone putting in all that effort for a year, is losing less than five pounds practically significant? Many would say no. You absolutely need common sense here. That's a huge point. A headline might scream significant results, but it might not mean much in reality. What other pitfalls in analyzing data should we watch out for? Oh, there are several common traps. A really big one is confusing correlation with causation. Just because two things seem related or move together doesn't mean one causes the other. Right, the classic mantra, correlation does not imply causation. You got it. Think of those funny examples. Margarine use and divorce rates in Maine might correlate, but one doesn't cause the other. Or uh, the number of storks and the number of babies. They might increase together in certain areas, but... Yeah, storks aren't actually delivering babies. Shocking, I know. Exactly. Another trap, reported data instead of measured data Asking people their weight often gets you their desired weight, not their actual weight. Measuring is better. Makes sense. Then you have loaded questions and surveys. The way you phrase a question can totally push people towards a certain answer. Like asking about the line item veto to eliminate waste. Right. That got 97% yes. But a neutral phrasing, should the president have the line item veto or not? Only got 57% yes. Huge difference just from wording. And even the order you ask questions in matters. It can, yeah. Asking about traffic problems before asking about industrial pollution might subtly shift blame in people's minds. Also, watch out for non-response. If lots of people refuse to answer a survey or certain parts of it, the results might be biased because the people who did respond might be different in some important way. Low response rates are a red flag. You're finally misleading percentages. These seem to be everywhere, especially ads. They really are. Claims like reduce costs by 200% or cut your risk by 400%, those are mathematically impossible. 100% of something is all of it. You can't reduce something by more than all of it. Right. Basic math check needed there. Yeah, just remember percent means out of 100. Being aware of all these pitfalls really empowers you to look at news reports, ads, everything much more critically. Definitely. Okay, so armed with these critical thinking tools, let's get back to the data itself. Once we have it, what different types and levels do we need to understand to make sure we analyze it the right way? 
Okay, first let's quickly revisit parameter versus statistic. Remember, a parameter describes a whole population while a statistic describes a sample. Yeah, population parameter, sample statistic, easy mnemonic. Exactly. So if a survey of, say, 1,659 adults finds 28% own a credit card, that 28% is the statistic from the sample. If we somehow knew the true percentage for all 250 million U.S. adults, that number would be the parameter. Makes sense. Then we split data into quantitative versus categorical. I kind of think of it as numbers versus labels. That's a great way to put it. Quantitative data is numerical. It represents counts or measurements, things like age, height, weight. And a super important detail here, always include the units. The book mentions the NASA Mars Climate Orbiter disaster lost because one team used English units, the other used metric. $125 million, oops, because of units. Wow. Lesson learned. And categorical. Categorical or qualitative data consists of names or labels, gender, yes, no answers, political affiliation. One small caution. Sometimes numbers are used as codes for categories, like one for male, two for female. Even though they're numbers, they don't measure anything, so it's still categorical data. Okay. And then for quantitative data, the number stuff, there's another split. Discrete versus continuous. What's that about? Right. Discrete data means the number of possible values is either finite or countable. Like the number of eggs a hen lays, you can't lay 2.5 eggs, or the number of students in a class. Continuous data, on the other hand, can take on infinitely many possible values within a range. Think height, weight, temperature. You can always, in theory, measure more precisely. Ah, okay. Countable items versus measurable quantities. Pretty much. And a quick grammar tip the book throws in. Use fewer for discrete things, fewer eggs, and less for continuous things, less milk. Handy. All right, finally, the four levels of measurement. Nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. Why are these so critical? Because the level of measurement tells you exactly what kinds of math and statistical methods you can actually use on the data. Get this wrong, and your analysis could be completely invalid. It's fundamental. Okay, let's break them down. Lowest level first. That's nominal. It's just names, labels, categories, no natural order. Think survey responses like yes noun decided or eye colors or types of cars. You can count them, but you can't meaningfully order them or calculate an average eye color. Right, just categories. What's next up? Ordinal data. Now, this data can be put in some meaningful order, but the differences between the values aren't necessarily meaningful or consistent. Think course grades. A, B, C, D, F. You know A is better than B. But is the difference in performance between an A and a B the same as between a C and a D? You can't really say. Yeah. Movie ratings, one to five stars, are another example. Okay, so order matters, but the gaps between ranks don't. Then interval. Interval level data can be ordered, and the differences are meaningful and consistent. But, and this is key, there's no natural zero starting point. Zero doesn't mean the complete absence of the thing being measured. Temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit is the classic example. Zero degrees C isn't no heat. It's just the freezing point of water. And because there's no true zero, ratios don't make sense. You can't say 20 degrees C is twice as hot as 10 degrees C. Years, like 1990-2024, are also interval. Ah, uh, the no true zero point is the key there. Which brings us to the highest level. Ratio data. This has everything. Order, meaningful differences, and a natural zero point, where zero means none of the quantity. Heights, weights, distances, durations of time. Zero centimeters means no height. Zero minutes means no time. And here, ratios do make sense. Someone who is 180 centimeters tall is twice as tall as someone who is 90 centimeters. A 10-minute break is twice as long as a 5-minute break. Okay, so quick checks. Does twice as much make sense? Does zero mean none? If yes to both, it's ratio. That's the perfect way to think about it. So understanding these levels, uh, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio, mm -hmm. it's like having a secret decoder ring, whether you're looking at a small survey or those huge big data sets everyone talks about. Absolutely. Because again, the level dictates the math you can do. Mismatching leads to nonsense. And yeah, this is super relevant with big data. We're talking massive, complex data sets from things like, you know, UPS tracking millions of packages, Google analyzing traffic flow from phones, Netflix knowing viewing habits. It spawned the whole field of data science. It's mind-boggling scale. Yeah. And within any data set, big or small, you're going to have missing data sometimes, right? How do we handle that? Good question. Missing data is common, and you need to think about why it's missing. If it's missing completely at random, maybe a random typo, someone got distracted during data entry, ignoring it, probably won't bias your results too much. But if it's missing not at random, like maybe lower income people are less likely to report their income, then ignoring that missing data will likely bias your results. 
your sample won't accurately reflect the population anymore. You have to consider the why. Okay, that makes sense. Now let's get to the final really crucial piece. Actually, gathering the sample data. The book has that powerful line. If sample data are not collected in an appropriate way, the data may be so utterly useless that no amount of statistical torturing can salvage them. That really sticks with you. It's stark, but it's true. For experiments, the gold standard involves randomness, usually with placebo and treatment groups. A placebo, as you probably know, is just a dummy treatment, a sugar pill, maybe to provide a comparison baseline. And blinding is key. Single blind means the subjects don't know if they got the real treatment or the placebo. Double blind is even better. Neither the subjects nor the researchers interacting with them know who got what. This prevents bias creeping in. Like in that huge Salk vaccine trial back in the 50s. Exactly. A landmark study. Almost half a million kids were randomly assigned to get either the real vaccine or placebo shot. The results were clear. Far fewer kids who got the actual vaccine developed polio. That large scale, the randomization, the blinding it, allowed them to definitively prove the vaccine worked. And this really underscores the massive difference between an experiment like that and just an observational study, right? Absolutely critical difference. In an experiment, you, the researcher, actively apply a treatment and then observe the effects. You're intervening. In an observational study, you just watch. You measure characteristics, record what happens, but you don't try to change anything. Like the ice cream and drowning example. If you just observe, you might see both go up in the summer and wrongly think ice cream causes drowning. Precisely. You're missing the lurking variable, the hot weather that drives both ice cream sales and swimming. An experiment, if you could ethically do one, would separate those. So good experiments need refutation, using enough subjects, blinding to control for placebo effects and bias, and randomness to create comparable groups. Okay. And for surveys, where we're not applying treatments but just gathering info, we already talked about avoiding convenience and voluntary response samples. What are the good ways? The absolute best is a simple random sample. Every individual and every possible group of the desired size has an equal chance of being selected. Pure chance. Other valid methods include systematic sampling. Pick a random starting point, then select every, say, 10th or 50th person. Then there's stratified sampling. Divide your population into relevant subgroups or strata, like different age groups or genders, and then take a random sample from each subgroup. This ensures representation. Right. And cluster sampling. That one sometimes confuses me a bit. Yeah, the distinction is important. With cluster sampling, you divide the population into sections or clusters, maybe geographic areas like city blocks or schools. Then you randomly select some of the clusters, and then you include all members from those selected clusters in your sample. Think all in the chosen group. Okay, stratified samples from each group. Cluster takes all from chosen groups. That's it. And often, especially in large national surveys, they use multi-stage sampling, which is just combining several of these methods and stages. Maybe stratify by region, then cluster by town, then systematically sample households. So, the bottom line is crystal clear. How you get your data is everything. It can make or break the whole study. Like your professor said, randomness needs help. It requires careful planning. Definitely. And even with good planning, errors can happen. There's sampling error that's just the natural, unavoidable difference between your sample result and the true population value because of random chance. It happens even with perfect random sampling. But then there are non-sampling errors. These are human mistakes. Bad data entry, biased questions, people lying, using the wrong statistical analysis. And the worst kind is non-random sampling error, which comes from using those bad methods we talked about, like convenience or voluntary response. Those introduce systematic bias that random chance can't explain away. Wow. Okay, we have covered a ton of ground today. From the absolute basics data, stats, population, sample through the whole study process. We've looked at spotting misleading graphs, bad sampling, the crucial difference between statistical and practical significance, all those pitfalls like correlation isn't causation, the data types and levels, big data, missing data, and finally, the absolute bedrock importance of good data collection and experimental design. You really are equipped now with some powerful tools to look at data critically. So let me leave you with a final thought to chew on. The chapter mentions this old study from 1835 by a Swiss doctor, Lombard. He looked at death certificates and concluded that being a student was the most dangerous or unhealthy profession with an average age of death around 20 years old. Now, based on everything we've discussed, sampling, context, potential pitfalls, why might that conclusion, even if the numbers on the certificates were technically correct, be totally misleading? Think about it. What happens to people who are students? They usually stop being students around that age, right? It highlights how numbers without critical thinking can paint a completely skewed picture. 
Keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep making sense of the numbers that shape our world. And from the entire Deep Dive team, thank you so much for joining us.